Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. I hope all you are doing very well. In this video, I'm going to talk more about loyalty programs. Are you ready? Then let's get started. One of the key factors of successful CRM implementation is how to make customers alive. I introduced several strategies to enhance customer retention, including customer satisfaction management, sales efforts to encourage repeat purchases, and building strong switch costs that provide customers with clear reason why they have to stay. Then, let's think about this. The strategies for customer retention look like closely related to customer loyalty. In the very first lecture of Conceptual Foundations, you learned the traditional view of CLM. Loyalty is the key driver of profit. And you also learned that CLM is a broader concept. It basically deals with the customers to be profitable. But it does not mean that loyalty is nothing. Loyalty itself is still an important factor to facilitate customer profitability. So marketers still seriously take care of customer loyalty by rewarding customers in various campaigns, which are called loyalty programs. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce the loyalty programs. The bottom line is that loyalty programs do not directly touch the customer loyalty. What does that mean? And why are they called loyalty programs? Now, let's dive into the loyalty and loyalty programs to address these questions. First, customer loyalty. Here are three different brands. One is Ferrari, a heist and sport car brand. I love this brand. I love its signature red color, its fancy design, and its amazing performance. I don't have it because it is super expensive, but if I want Powerball, what I would do very first is buying Ferrari. Another brand is Heist which is the largest ketchup and condiment brand in the United States. In my fridge, there always a high ketchup and mayonnaise. But frankly speaking, I've never considered the brand when I buy ketchup. I have picked the first one on the shelf, and Heinz is just the one there. The other is Apple. Here, I admit that I'm a fanboy of Apple's products. I love all Apple's lineup. In my office, I have two iMacs. I'm also using a MacBook Pro and an iPad Pro, and they are my third MacBook and iPad. And I have been using only iPhone since 2010, and I have Apple Watch on my wrist, and I also have AirPod and AirPod Max as well. The reason why I'm talking about those brands is that they are good examples of two different definitions of loyalty, behavioral loyalty and attitudinal loyalty. Here are the definitions. First, behavioral loyalty. It is about actually observed actions that customers demonstrate toward a particular product or service. And Second, attitudinal loyalty. It is about perception and attitudes that a customer has in her mind. Then, let's go back to the three brands. Ferrari. Again, I love it. I love its iconic red color, fancy design, and amazing performance. It's my dream car. All of these are talking about my attitudinal loyalty toward Ferrari. How about behavioral loyalty? As I told you, I don't have a Ferrari. If you ask me to prove my loyalty, I can't. Because there is neither evidence nor action that explicitly shows I love it. That is, 
there is no behavioral loyalty toward Barry. Height. Again, there always are height ketchup and mayonnaise in my fridge. So I have very strong behavioral loyalty toward height. But how about attitudinal loyalty? As I told you, I've bought Heinz not because it's my favorite, but because it's just there at the first position on the shelf. That is, I have no attitudinal loyalty toward Heinz. Then, how about Apple? I have admitted I'm an Apple fanboy. So, I have a strong attitudinal loyalty toward Apple. Also, I have almost all Apple's products. That is, I also have strong behavioral loyalty toward Apple. These two definitions of loyalty are very important because we usually mix both types of loyalty in practice. If they were strongly correlated to each other, it would not matter. It would be okay to mix both definitions. But in reality, they are not always strongly correlated to each other. In my example of the three brands, you already found that my attitudinal loyalty does not always match my behavioral loyalty, vice versa. One more example, switching costs. Professor Kim, it's me, I'm a frequent flyer member of American Airlines. I admit that I prefer Delta to American due to Delta's superior quality of service and experience. Nevertheless, I may continue to travel with American because I have accrued lots of America's mileage and I want to redeem the mileage. To switch from American to Delta, I have to lose my AA mileage which is a switching cost. Then, to which brand am I behaviorally loyal? American. Because I accrued lots of American points, meaning that I fly with American a lot. And to which brand am I attitudinally loyal? It's Delta. As I admitted, I prefer Delta due to its quality and my good experience. This example shows that behavioral loyalty and attitudinal loyalty can be opposite to each other. There is another example, habitual purchases. In their article, Lafley and Martin pointed out that customer loyalty is overrated because of habitual purchases. Customers often habitually purchase a brand they bought in the past or a leading brand because it is easy. For example, Tide is the leading brand of laundry detergent that dominates the shelf in grocery stores as in the picture. Just picking one from the shelf again and again, many customers repeatedly buy Tide detergent. This advantage accumulates over time and is getting stronger. Due to the cumulative advantage of the market leaders, it is very hard for a new player to take on the leaders. The main implication of the article is that repeated purchases of a brand are attributed not only to the attitudinal loyalty and high product values, but also to such habitual purchases. Thus, we have to be careful to enter behavioral observations of repeated purchases as brand loyalty. Then, now let's talk about loyalty programs. First of all, loyalty programs do not directly deal with customer loyalty, although they are quite related to the loyalty. A loyalty program is basically defined as a marketing activity that provides rewards for customers who show repeat purchases. Some of you may be familiar with this beverage card from Rural Cafe at Mason Hall. 
This is a typical example of a loyalty program. Before the pandemic, Lure Cafe gave me a coffee drink for free as a reward when I bought nine coffee drinks. And how does it work? As I get stamps more and more, I expect the free reward more strongly. All of you may have the same experience. Oh, I have A stamps. Just one more cup, I'm gonna have free coffee. Here, the goal of this activity is not building true loyalty toward Rural Cafe. Rural Cafe is not interested in whether I love its coffee or not. As you know well, it's just Starbucks coffee. What Rural Cafe actually wants is to make me and you buy coffee there instead of other shops. That is, the main goal of Lord program is to encourage customers to repeat their purchases. More precisely, a loyalty program is a device that makes a customer's past purchase become a reason of her next purchase, switching cost. In CRM, loyalty program plays another important role, data gathering method. For example, when you are shopping at Kroger, you may scan your Kroger shopper's card at checkout. Your card works as an ID card, so Kroger can record the list of what you buy on your ID. This becomes great information for Kroger. It can track your purchases over time. Kroger figures out what will be the best deal for you in your next shopping and prints out the deal with your receipt. That is, by the use of a loyalty program, marketers are able to identify a reward and retain profitable customers. Then, how does the grocery store extract the information from the customer's transaction record? Let me illustrate the mechanism. With the loyalty card information, the grocery store can analyze each customer's price sensitivity. Once the sensitivity to price is computed, the store can do simulation of what would happen if a deal is given to the customers. From the simulation, the store identifies which household becomes more profitable with the deal. Here is an example. For simplicity, suppose that there are two customers, customer A and customer B. And for both customers, there were price variations from $1 to $3 for a specific product in their transaction record. Customer A bought 5 units when the price was $1, 3 units when the price was $2, and only 1 unit when the price was $3. However, customer B always bought 5 units regardless of price. And then, customer A is highly likely to be a price sensitive customer. If this customer saw a cheaper price, he would buy more. But Customer B is highly likely to be a price insensitive customer. She may say, I don't care price. So, based on the sensitivity computations, the grocery store knows the customer's price sensitivity or price coefficient. Sorting the customers by the price sensitivity, the grocery store has this histogram. Price sensitive customers are on the left here, and price insensitive customers are on the right in the figure here. Then, the store does simulation to see what would happen. The store computes expected profits for different couponing scenarios. This is a real-life example conducted by a Chicago-based grocery store. This store analyzed 332 households' yogurt purchases, and this table shows the simulation result. 
if the store sends out a discount coupon only to the top 10 price sensitive customers, the store expects about $1,848 additional profit. In this case, a small number of customers could have the discount deal, so the average margin per unit would be high, but the expected increase in demand would be low. If the store sends out a discount coupon only to the top 150 price sensitive customers, the store expects about $1,859 additional profit. In this case, a large number of customers could have the discount deal, so a large increase in demand would be expected, but the average margin per unit would be low. The best case where the additional profit is expected to be maximized is to send out the coupon to the top 60 price sensitive customers. This is the knowledge the grocery store could know from an analysis with data gathered through a loyalty program. Then, now let's dive into the goals of loyalty programs in detail. What to aim? There are four key objectives of introducing loyalty programs. Building true loyalty, efficiency profit, effectiveness profit, and value alignment. First, true loyalty. Enticing customers with rewards and bonuses is enforcing loyalty, not creating true loyalty. So the rewards and bonuses must be designed to deliver the value of products and services. And why true loyalty is important? Because true fans will enthusiastically spread word of mouth. Here's an example. You may know Lush stores. Lush is a cosmetics retailer. It produces and sells creams, soaps, shampoos, shower gels, lotions, moisturizers, scrubs, masks, and other cosmetics for the face, hair, and body using only vegetarian recipes, 85% of which are also vegan. And believe it or not, the company has never spent on advertising. How Lush has grown without even a dime on advertising? Here is the answer. Please pause the lecture video for a while and read this article. The company have trained big fans of the products, not sales staff. The fans share their experience with customers and the customers spread the experience. This is the best marketing practice with no costs. Second, efficiency profit. Efficiency profit means a change in the customer's buying behavior induced by the loyalty program. That is, loyalty programs are designed to turn a profit. We can observe the signal of profit by loyalty programs in various ways. If a loyalty program successfully turns a profit, marketers may observe an increase in customers' basket size, which means purchase volume and purchase frequency. Price sensitivity also signals an increase in profit. Lower price sensitivity indicates that price does not matter and therefore larger profits are expected. In a competitive market, share of wallet also signals an increase in profits. If a loyalty program of a firm works well, more customers choose the firm's products and services rather than the competitor's ones. And definitely, Successful loyalty programs lead to a high retention rate and long lifetime duration. And the key to profit increase is to build up customers' switching costs. 
Airlines Frequent Flyer Program or Mileage Program is a good example of switching costs. As in my airline preference example, accrued miles and points induce repeat purchases and lead to more profit. Third, Effectiveness Profit Effectiveness Profit is referred to as sustainable competitive advantages in the long run. This is more related to a firm's strategy level. A loyalty program works as a marketing tool to gather information about customer behaviors and preferences. Using this tool, marketers can learn new knowledge which will be used to design better products, services, and offers in the future. That is, a loyalty program as a data gathering tool provides a chance for evolution. And what does evolution mean? Recall your Netflix page. Netflix recommends new TV shows and movies based on what you have added and what you have watched. As you watch it more TV shows and movies, the system evolves with the data of your history and recommends more suitable shows and movies for you. Netflix sells not only streaming, but also curation personalized for each customer. Last, value alignment. Simply speaking, value alignment is a kind of good discrimination. It means firms serve more valuable customers in better manner. If a loyalty program equally serves customers, regardless of how much they spend or how many times they repeat it, there is no incentive for customers to collect reward points. Customers may redeem the points as soon as possible whenever they accrue the points. That is, the loyalty program does not work as switching codes. Value alignment is particularly important if there is a big difference between customers in preferences and cost to serve. For example, a room upgrade offer works only if there are customers who want a better room in their traveling. If all travelers identically prefer the standard room, there would be no reason to offer a room upgrade as a reward. Here is an example. The table presents Hilton Hotel's membership structure. Compared to standard members, gold and diamond members enjoy much more benefits like a free continental breakfast. This discrimination works well only if there are many customers who like Hilton Hotel's continental breakfast. If the free breakfast benefit is appealing to such customers, then it incentivizes the customers to choose Hilton instead of competing hotels to upgrade their memberships. So far, I have introduced loyalty programs. A loyalty program is a marketing tool which does not directly deal with customers' loyalty. As a tool, a loyalty program is used to encourage repeat purchases and it gives marketers very valuable information for other promotional activities. But loyalty programs are not always helpful for marketers. Sometimes it betrays and harms the business. In their article, loyalty program is betraying you, Nunes and Rezar, contrast good loyalty programs to bad loyalty programs and gives us insights for loyalty program designs. As mentioned, a loyalty program itself does not guarantee improvement in profitability. The article illustrates five useful recipes for loyalty programs. First, switching cost. As I mentioned earlier, a loyalty program improves profits by building a switching cost. An example in the article is Sprint Reward Program 
for long distance phone users. You may not be familiar with the long distance phone. Now, cell phones are very popular and it is very natural that everyone has his or her own number. But just 20 years ago, there were so many people without a cell phone and those people relied on landline phones for communication. At that time, the price differed across the distance. To call a person in LA from New York City, the price of the phone call was much higher than that of a phone call in a local area. Sprint, which was a successful long-distance phone service provider, gathered phone call histories of each customer and rewarded heavy users by giving some airline mileage as a gift. This program was successful because the customer who used long-distance phone many times was highly likely to be a business person and have business trips many times. So, for such customer, extra airline mileage would be the best gift, a clear reason to stay as a Sprint customer. Second, type of rewards. In a store, you may see lots of gift cards near the checkout. A $50 gift card is sold at exactly $50, not $55 or $60. Then, why do stores produce and sell the gift card? For gift-giving customers? Maybe not. There is a huge difference between gift cards and cash. Amazon gift card can be used only in Amazon. Target gift cards can be used only in Target. That means, by buying a gift card, customers pay the face value of the card in advance of actual purchases of products, and the store earns the face value of the card in advance of actual sales of products. In other words, future transactions are made in advance for sure. We can apply the same logic to customer rewards. If a store offers money back as a reward, it is uncertain where the rewarded customer goes with the money. But if a store offers a gift card as a reward, it is for sure that the rewarded customer will be back to the store to use the gift card. So, a gift card makes the rewarded customer come back again at least once. And Costco's reward certificate is the best practice of this strategy. It is one of my reasons to shop in Costco. One can ask, isn't it possible that the customer does not use the gift card? Yes, it's possible. But if that's the case, the store spent nothing because the gift card is not used and therefore the store rewarded the customer at no cost. Third, encouraging additional purchases. This is very simple. I already introduced this, the beverage card. Of course, there are lots of differences between loyalty programs in detail. But the basic concept is identical. It tries to make past purchases become switching costs for the next purchases. Fourth, data. A loyalty program plays as an ID card as I explained. This allows for individual level promotion activities. Please recall Horace Entertainment, which is a casino in Las Vegas. In the first lecture, I introduced Horace promotional activities. Horace analyzed individual past visitors' data and found the best target for the promotional activities and the best reward for the target customers. In addition, please keep this in your mind. Loyalty program itself allows for data collection. Last. The right performance measure. Again, 
The goal of CLM activities, including Lloyd programs, is to turn a profit. American Airlines profitably sells miles to other businesses to use as rewards for their customers. For example, credit card companies offer extra miles as rewards to their heavy credit card users. But the extra miles are not for free. Credit card companies buy the miles from airline companies. In the early 2000s, the airline sold the right to 25K miles for $500, but the 25K mile reward actually cost less than $15 to fulfill, leading to huge profits. And where this idea was coming from? from the right performance measure. American Airlines did not limit the loyalty program to a promotional activity for its own customer retention. It equally counted the profitability of the loyalty program and that of its main business, leading to a new business using the loyalty program. Then, what are the bad loyalty programs? Loyalty programs are typically founded on some simple mistakes. Here are examples. First, some loyalty programs are designed like another discount program. This usually happens in a competitive market. To steal competitors' customers, a company offers double points, another one offers triple points, and the other offers quadruple points. Of course, this tip for tech competitive move benefits customers. There are so many free rewards and all companies end up with very low profitability. That is, the Lord programs are no more than new discount programs. Second, marketers should carefully consider who are rewarded. Grocery stores loyalty program with store cards is usually connected with optimal couponing and member-exclusive discount offers. Then, smart shoppers exploit the store cards to get discount coupons and offers. They accumulate store cards as many as possible and do price shopping. This implies typical grocery store's loyalty program does not reward loyal behavior it rewards store card ownership, which is not what marketers expect from loyalty programs. Third, marketers should carefully align benefits with customer value. For example, suppose two different customers of a casino. One is a customer who visits every month and spends just $100 per visit. The other is a customer who visits once a year but spends $10,000 per visit. Who should the casino reward more? The frequent visitor or the big player? Simply, one more visit of the big player generates additional revenue as much as 100 more visits of the frequent player. Thus the casino would better to focus on the big player instead of the frequent visitor. That is, the casino should reward profitability, not purchase volume. Fourth, marketers should think of the cost part as well. There are various types of rewards, and the cost of reward offers depends on the types. For example, a discount offer incurs a huge cost and sometimes generates a loss despite its great impact on sales. If that's the case, it would be better to sort out other rewards such as a free delivery service. Last, marketers should offer what they can do only. When a loyalty program pledges to reward customers with preferential treatment, like shorter lines and expedited deliveries, it must ensure that the special services provided 
are better than standard services. The key is that customers tend to remember extreme case only. That is, customers notice the speed of service only if they are being served slower than standard services. If the special services were successfully provided most times, but there was an extreme failure of the services, customers may not count the success and focus only on the one failure. So, managers need to ensure that the lower bounds of the special service never look worse than standard service. All right, that's all I have in this lecture, and let me wrap up with a short summary. Loyalty program is a marketing process based on customers' repeat purchases. Enhancing customer loyalty is one of the goals of loyalty program, not the only one goal. Loyalty programs offer an important CRM tool, data gathering. The key objectives of loyalty programs are building to loyalty, enhancing profits by switching costs, sustainable competitive advantages, proper value alignment. Offering loyalty program itself does not guarantee improvement in profitability.